Welcome to the long game, a place where effort, time, and energy matter. Today's guest is someone who I found to be remarkable, exceptional, and someone that I think all of us can learn from, who is uh, Meredith Bronk, CEO and president of OST, was introduced to me by actually one of her employees, someone that I came across when I joined West Michigan a little over a year ago. And this gentleman repeatedly sang praises about Meredith's leadership, empathy, understanding, and care for the team. So thank you very much for agreeing to being to joining me on the podcast. Um, let's begin the way we begin all of the every single episode, and that is turning it over to you. For any introduction, anything you would like to share about yourself, your organization, your current role. Sure. Thanks, Milos. And uh, thank you for that uh, introduction. It's uh, nice that Christian both made that introduction and uh, had such nice things to say. Uh, as you mentioned, I'm Meredith Bronk, uh, currently uh, CEO and president of OST, uh, a role that I've held for almost seven years now uh, with a business that I've been in for just about 24 years. I joined OST as a project manager a long, long time ago. Uh, and, uh, from CEO as a teenager, of course. Yes, of course. <laughs> That's my story anyway, uh, <laughs> to president and CEO grew up in the business. Uh, I am also a wife and a mother to three daughters, 17, I almost said teenage daughters. They're not quite so young anymore. 17, 19 and 21. Um, as a little bit of background technology, OST is a technology company. That's a great big category. Uh, we are a global uh, consultancy uh, in the technology and what we call kind of the digital space. We are headquartered here in Grand Rapids and West Michigan. We have offices in Detroit and Minneapolis and solutions really around the globe uh, from our domestic uh, offices uh, in the Midwest. Um, we help market leaders um, solve two problems, I like to describe, especially to the folks who aren't in our industry, two problems, how and where technology runs and how we use technology to transform business. Um, for some companies, those two decisions are made in silos. Fewer and fewer can afford that uh, opportunity anymore. For some companies, those are made hand in glove. So, we talk a lot about both the human side, and I know we're gonna talk a little bit about this today, the human side of solving uh, how technology can be levered as well as the technology solutions. And we spend a lot of time helping businesses uh, navigate both the human and technology parts of driving solutions for their companies. Absolutely. Um, as we both know, it's, it's always people first and it's rarely a, a technical issue or a problem. If somebody has figured it out somewhere, anywhere on this planet, so can we. It's, it's finding the right folks and, and you know, enabling them, supporting them, and promoting their growth and advancement. Um, what do you, so what you mentioned in your intro is relevant, I think, I think to everyone who's awake today, right? If you are in today's world, no matter what industry you may be in, what business, what organization, what your role is, technology is at the center of it all, in everybody's business, even when others don't want us to be. And we are hopefully doing that in a positive way where we're enabling and transforming and guiding their capabilities, whether it's finance or marketing, HR, facilities, whatever it may be, product uh, research and development. We're there to help make things better. Now, based on your exposure to the industry or different industries and different organizations, what do you see as your current priorities for you as an executive senior leader of your organization? Where do you spend most of your time? What do you see as your primary areas of focus, primary opportunities and priorities for you and then for your company as a well? whole? Yeah, I think, you know, you laid it out. It's such a big topic. And um, in general, I think technology, it's so ubiquitous right now. When I think about big picture priorities, I think there's two. One is we have the responsibility as leaders, but also through the use of technology to create certainty where we can. And in an uncertain world, we're all dealing with so much uncertainty that um, where can we create certainty for others? so that we can, priority number two, move fast. 
we have to be able to move quickly. And moving quickly in times of uncertainty is a challenge. It's a challenge to be able to get people on board. It's a challenge to be able, especially as organizations, for us to be able to do the necessary work that we need to do. So when I think about priorities and they go kind of ladder, if you will, I was thinking about, is it clarity or certainty? Certainty or clarity? I think they're a little bit one and the same. Um, and you can only have so much certainty, but in, a, in an uncertain world, and we've only gotten more uncertain, prolonged uncertainty for sure, creates something in the brain that just, it uses our energy, it takes our mental capacity, it's hard to be creative, right? There's all of this research that says that that's true. So where we can create certainty, we must, to free up the creative energy for our teams, to bring their best selves so that we can move quickly to create those solutions that we know that we need for ourselves and our own organizations, as well as to help others really come up with the solutions that we need to change how we do what we do. I think that certainty or clarity or uh, reliability, safety, you can say it in many different ways. It's building that solid foundation on top of which we can ideate and create and try new things. Everybody wants the penthouse, right? But nobody, but everybody understands that you're going to have a construction site that's dangerous and dirty and messy for a while as you're building and coming out of the ground so that at some point down the road, you can enjoy that top view. Yes. Um, as you look at bringing your team or other teams to help organizations create that certainty, um, and transform their business and move fast. Because in today's world, quality matters. Quality has always mattered. But I think time to market matters even more in many industries today. And I don't know if that's a fortunate or unfortunate byproduct of the culture that we're in. But where do you see, what, do you, what are some of the major opportunities that you see, whether across your own organization as you're looking to always adjust and pivot and be relevant and provide new services to your customers and across the industry, when I say industry, I mean tech industry or different industries that you serve and partner in, what are some of the major opportunities that you think um, your either current or prospective clients could um, do better in or approach in a different manner? Yeah, that, that's a great question. When I think about um, acceleration and for sure, from our business perspective in the course of the last 12 months, you know, 2020 was a little bit of a wait and see, wait and see, wait and see. And then people came out just gangbusters uh, during the course of calendar 21. So as we sit here kind of starting into 22, it's been hard just to keep up. And so when I think about acceleration, which is really kind of the, the, the great opportunity. What we're talking about right now, what I'm thinking a lot about and talking to other leaders about is acceleration in adoption. How are we changing how technology is being adopted? Because at the end of the day, you talked earlier, the technology is not the limitation. It's the human factor that becomes a limitation. So if you think about it in terms of adoption, to me, there are two things that we're helping people think differently about. One is the human aspect. So whether that is about the behavioral research, whether it's about going in and truly keeping your customer at the front and at the, at the core of the decisions that you make, thinking intentionally about the design elements and kind of how we're thinking about who we're designing for and what we're trying to do in order to drive adoption. And on the back side of that, the data. The data that we have today as companies and as an organization, the data that we have is so rich. How are we using that data to tell us what we need to know to help to accelerate adoption? We have to be willing to hear the things that we believe to be true and the things that we might not want to hear. The data, between the data and the human elements, it, the qualitative and quantitative aspects are both there. So our ability, I think, to hear and listen so that we can accelerate the adoption process at the end of the day, I think that's what this is all about. We've thrown technology out there in the world over the course of the last 10 or 12 years. And the true acceleration and the market leaders who are capturing, the ones who are running, 
are the ones who are able to meet the adoption needs of their users, who can give a Starbucks-like experience in a college atmosphere, right? In a totally different industry, who can cross over what those experiential expectations are. Because users today, consumers today, do expect that. They expect us to, to be able to provide no matter where we are. If it's a business to business transaction, they expect those same things. So how are we thinking about the adoption in order to accelerate the adoption of our technology? That's what we have to be thinking about. As you were speaking, one of the things that kept coming to mind is something I've heard from a friend um, and a colleague, Jamie Passup, who is the former chief educational evangelist, if you will, for Google that for about 15 years or so um and one of the things that he said to a number of us a few months ago at this event he goes look i you know i'm in phoenix i know how long it takes me to get to the airport um i traveled over 300,000 miles a year for google traveling all, all around the country and the world and going to different places i know i have my one day back three day back seven day bags packed i know exactly what i need when to leave when to get in priority check-in off i go and it works for me. He goes, but do you know, can you even imagine how long I would resist the change if Google called me and said, Jamie, you travel so much that we're going to give you a private jet. We're going to have a private jet waiting for you. He goes, I wouldn't fight that change at all, even though what I have now works for me, but it's something better. And it's telling that story, what you're saying about getting the, uh, accelerating the adoption is, and that really stuck with me, and I've shared this with some of my teams, is how do we build people a private jet? How do you give them something more, better, more effective, more efficient than what they have today? Don't we'll just give them the same interface, but a different color. It used to be blue, now it's green. Yay, the digital transformation. Is it really? You know, they used to do 17 clicks, now they do 14. Is it really better? That's, is that worth that, you know, opportunity? Or, or, or time that one needs to invest in learning something new and changing their behavior. And, you know, as we all know, we are creatures of habit, especially when I used to live in Jersey and, and kind of greater New York City area. I would drive to work the same way, same day, every morning. I would get stuck at the same light. I would hit that same pothole every morning, even though I knew it was there. But that's the habit. That's how we were trained. That's how you... Um, feel most comfortable. So getting people into this zone of uncomfort and growth and advancement is, is a challenging task. So you spoke about data, you spoke about experiences, you spoke about accelerating the overall change. Yeah. What did we learn over the last two years during the pandemic or, me, or if you want to go further back, but I think we've learned a lot in the last 22 months or so. What do you think we keep? What do you think we potentially throw away? as we move forward when it comes to the future of both life and work? Where does one end? Where does another one begin? Yeah. And where do you see that moving forward? Yeah. You know, it's interesting. Um, I'm actually leading, uh, we do company-wide calls periodically, and we have a company-wide call actually scheduled for tomorrow afternoon. And um, the topic, and sometimes we talk about a lot of things. Tomorrow's topic, we're going to spend almost the entire call on a single topic. And the topic is around flexibility, boundaries, and our culture. And the reason that we're talking about that is because we've had a flexible culture for 20 years, 25 years, almost forever. I've often said to people for a long, long time, you can come to work. I don't care if you work at seven o'clock at night or seven o'clock in the morning in your fuzzy slippers or a tuxedo. Like, I don't care, get your job done. Like that's just how we've been. And it's been really interesting over the last couple of years to watch how people have navigated that truth. And what has occurred to me is that while we've always been flexible, the way people are choosing to exercise that flexibility has changed. Because even though I had flexibility, I drove to work in the exact same route and ran into the exact same bottle and went for the, right? We still have our routines and we're still creatures of habit. And now we've changed some of those habits. So it's incumbent upon me, it's incumbent upon us to redefine what that flexibility means in today's world. 
And the main thing that I think I've learned as I've read research and been thinking about this, the, the thing that I think is probably hardest is about boundaries. And it's about setting those boundaries that we talk about the desire to have this flex for those of us who are able to work from home. So first of all, who have the privilege to be able to do that. There are a lot of people in this world who, who cannot. So I also want to recognize that we're speaking from a place of privilege, by the way, just when it comes to that, to be able to have the ability to work from anywhere, which most people in our industry do. So if you come from that place of privilege and you have that choice that we talk about that truth that we can work from anywhere and that people are leaving and they're, you know, moving and it's now work has to fit into my life instead of vice versa. And it's easy to talk about that truth. And the reality is, is that people have lost themselves. We're working longer that we, we lost our, our natural boundaries that existed before are gone. And so now if I'm working at seven o'clock at night and you're working at seven o'clock in the morning, we're passing each other. I'm wondering if you're working at seven o'clock at night, should I respond to my email to you that you just sent to me? And I'm going to send you one at seven. Like there's just, there's no boundaries. And I think oftentimes as humans, um, we don't, we're not great at setting boundaries. We're not great at setting boundaries in our personal lives. We're not great at setting boundaries with our families. Like just in general, we're not great at it. So when I think about what's ahead for us, and one of the things I'm going to talk about with my team tomorrow, it's about how are we setting boundaries so that we can, in fact, make good on our commitments. When I think about it, how are we doing that in a way that supports the autonomy that we want and that we crave and that we talk about in this work from home, but also that serves a collective purpose. So how are we doing that and doing that well collectively? That's the part when I think about this next turn that we have to make sure, I don't think we figured that part out yet. We, I think there's a lot of things that we figured out, but when I think about kind of where we're at right now at the beginning of 2022, there is this place that we're still a little bit in, in the middle of never, never land. And that's a component that I'm going to talk to my team about tomorrow. So what are your thoughts? I mean, it's, it's a wonderful um, conversation that I think we all need to have across all the organizations for a variety of reasons. Um, I've said this in the past, um, this was even before the pandemic. I generally don't get on emails and, you know, start responding to everyone at, at 6 a.m. I'm up. I might read them. I might reflect them. I might, you know, pick up a book or something else or, you know, put the kids, get the kids to school or whatever it is. Uh, but I don't do it early. But what I found is um, people who report to me historically or in the past, people who are on my teams, when I get home from work, I'll spend, you know, this family time, play with the kids were much young, even younger, you play with them, you have dinner, you put them to bed, and then it's 10 o'clock or whatever it is, and everybody else is in bed. I'm not. So then I go open that laptop, and now I'd be 11 or midnight. I'm, I just saw the stuff that people who work at 6 a.m. sent me. So I'm responding at that point. And what I've realized is that a lot of folks have to be really told directly, explicitly, just because I sent that email at midnight, doesn't mean you respond at 12.15, right? I just got to it at that point. So when your normal hours are, and if that's three days from now, because you're off the next three days, at 9 a.m., look at it then and respond. I'm also trying to be a lot more mindful of not sending notes outside those hours. I was really, really good over the, this break that we just had 10 days or so. Um, I don't think I've sent a single, I'm actually going to audit myself before I make that statement, but I don't believe I sent a single email or a note or a text or a call that was work-related. It was thanking, wishing people a Merry Christmas and Happy New Year and so forth. There's nothing like, can you look at that contract? Can you look at that agreement? Can you send me that policy? Can, it was none of that. But I'm just trying to think, what are, you, what, are you, what are your thoughts? What's your advice when it comes to, you know, regular work weeks kind of year round? If so, or if you have people who work in different time zones? That's when they work and maybe it's midnight where I am, but that's when they can respond. Yeah, time zones is an interesting thing. We're, we're Midwest based 
And we now have employees in 30 states because that's another thing that has happened for us over the course of the last, you know, two, two years, mostly. Um, so we're giving some guidelines. And you know what, you know what, the, the approach that, that we're having on this right now is that we talked about, do we put constraints? Do we set core hours? Because there are some businesses out there that are setting core hours or they're setting no meeting Fridays and they're putting some boundaries. They're setting corporate boundaries. What we're doing in our approach, and I use these words in, um, on purpose because they're words I'm going to use tomorrow, setting boundaries in a way that supports autonomy. Because people who choose to work from home, they want to know they have some level of autonomy in making some of those choices and how they work and live, but in a way that serve a collective purpose. And if you set the purpose and you believe and you trust that you're going toward the same purpose and you set the boundaries that say, yes, you have the autonomy to make that decision. So you have to be super clear about where those boundaries are. So I'm gonna give you permission to not respond to those emails in the middle of the night. I'm also gonna say, and I literally have this written down, like, hey, you just sent that email and you're wondering why you haven't had gotten a response back yet. It's been one hour. Before you call right. or text or send a follow-up email, you should probably ask yourself, is that person even awake yet? Like, check yourself, right? Like, and I think even in saying that as CEO of the business, saying that to the person who's sending that message also means if I receive that message that, hey, somebody really does have my back, that I don't have to look at that email. If they're getting that message from the CEO of the business, I guess I really do have the permission to not respond or not reply. I'm also talking about our tools. Here's how you set a delay send. Here's how you look on Slack to see what time zone people are in. Like we have tools out there who can also help us. So helping people help themselves is part of it, but you also have to trust that people want what's best in the collective. And that comes from setting that expectation and what our collective purpose is. At OST, we have this, one of our guiding principles is to delight our clients. That's one of our guiding principles. So well, quick little side story I'll just share with you. One of, the, one of the things that I'm thinking about is if I block my calendar and I block my calendar for 3 p.m. And I block my calendar for 3 p.m. for 20 minutes because I'm now work from home and I know at three o'clock I got kids walking in the door and the dogs are going to start barking. And I'm like, get your snacks, get your homework. Everybody's good. I got to go back on my calls right? That, this is something that happens. And then all of a sudden I get an invitation to step on a conference call with a client. If I get that invitation to sit on a conference call at three o'clock with a client, I now have a decision to make. Am I going to take that call with the client at three o'clock? I'm still going to have kids walking in the door and dogs barking and all that chaos coming in. I won't be at my best. And if you presume that what I want to be is at my best on the phone with the client, that by not respecting the fact that I've blocked myself at three o'clock, that I'm now not able to live that shared purpose we have, which is to delight our clients. So it's like, it's not because I'm a slacker. It's not because I'm just choosing to block my calendar. So I think there's also this intent and trust that has to go along with some of that. And thankfully at a place like OST, I feel like we're partway down that road because we've got a fairly high degree of trust inside of our company for other businesses and for other organizations. I think it's a tough hill to climb. It's a great example of, of speed versus intent. Um, and sometimes they come together, but is it better to be immediately available at three o'clock and be 50% of who you are and what you're capable of delivering, or is it just better to take it at 3.30 or four o'clock and be 100%, right? And if you communicate that and you have that through your support network and your mechanisms and your leadership team and so forth, if that becomes a norm, eventually the company and the clients and everybody else gets it, that, that there are, obviously you're always gonna have something that an urgency and emergent uh, move that needs to be made today and at this moment and not, you know, um, not a moment too soon, but you are absolutely right. It's being more intentional and, and seeing your empathy, seeing how you lead from, again, from as an outsider, you and I, you know, all combined, maybe chatted for a couple hours, but um, I wonder what your thoughts are about leadership as a whole. 
and a place where it has in success and or failures of organizations. Mm. That don't mean just you as the CEO, but you, your direct reports and others, and not necessarily only those who are in leadership positions, but those who are leading, even if they're not in leadership positions today. Tell me a bit about leadership. What is it? What does it mean to you? And what impact does it have on both present and future of your organization um, as you see it moving forward? Yeah. Um, you know, when I think about leadership, right, it's not about title. It's not about uh, um, role necessarily. It is about influence. Um, and I remember telling my girls when they were young, right? Use your power for good, not evil. Like, because <laughs> it can go both ways, by the way, um, right? That kind of influence. Uh, I think it's been interesting right now. So for, so from our, my perspective, I think um, we want to pour into folks who want to use their leadership skills and capabilities to drive to a shared purpose inside of OST. And I think most of the folks who I know who are good leaders and have that responsibility, that official title and responsibility are also doing that to pour into others right now. Um, getting folks who are proximate or not proximate together becomes an important component of that. So how are we making the space um, to share stories, to um, share ideas, to have an outlet, to be more than just whatever it is that I you know, kind of have on my business card becomes part of that investment. Um, I think in some ways our middle leaders have been squeezed the most the last couple of years that it's hard to care for others when you're exhausted. And um, at some level, I think some of our leaders, and that's what I'm hearing from some of our leaders inside the organization, they're tired and they're tired because they want so badly to care for the people who are around them and they are tired. And it's really, really hard to do when your cup is empty. So for us, it's like, how are you making sure that the leaders who are closest to the people who are doing the work, their cups are full and that the folks who are leading them, that their cups are full. Um, because at the end of the day, uh, especially right now, it is about making sure that folks feel like they have the energy, the time, and the space that it takes to take good care of the people that are around them. At the end of the day, that's what leaders do. It's not about them at all. It's about the people who are around them and how am I serving the folks who are around me. That's hard to do when I don't know who they are, when I don't have time to spend who they are. You have to make the time and the space to make investment in others. And the folks who do that are the ones who are and they also feel great about themselves when they do it, but it's hard, it can be hard, especially to, to make space the last couple of years. Yeah, yeah, it's that old, you know, manufacturing adage of managing by walking the floor, right? Go out there, see the folks, understand that that person that turns that screw all day, what's the impact? Not only should you understand, but you should help them understand that they're part of something larger than that perhaps task that can and might be automated at some point down the road of how they're contributing to something larger themselves. You talked about this in your kind of opening uh, comments, if you will, and you also touched on it now indirectly. Um, but we all live and die by our culture, right? And the, you know, the catch 22, what comes first, culture or the leadership? And what can influence the one over the other? Um, is Peter Drucker, right? One of one of the kind of found considered as one of the founding fa fathers of modern day management and research, said culture eats strategy for breakfast, and we've seen that. Right? You can do all kinds of things and try to be top down, and which not doesn't, which rarely actually works, because um, one should always focus on best ideas, and best ideas must win no matter where they come from. Um, and you can be very, you know sequential and you're using all the tools and methodologies and all the research of how you incentivize change and promote advancement and growth and collaboration, communication, teamwork. But if that's not resonating culturally, culturally across your organization, you, you have a challenge. So what are your thoughts on the overall culture and how does one influence it? How does one 
preserve what's good about it and what's valuable? And then how do you go about, which is the toughest part, how do you go about changing things that don't work? And for whatever reason, weren't addressed prior to maybe your arrival or prior to you being aware of that. Yeah. Um, you know, it, interestingly for me, I have the great benefit of having been at an organization for a long time and as one of the seven uh, who helped to buy out the company back in 2002, I got to help shape the culture that we've driven at OST. And one of the questions that I get often is, how do you preserve culture as we grow? Right. And the, the, even the question begs the reality that it's bound to change. Um, and when I think about culture, to me, culture is all about the behavior. Right. It's not about just the words. It's about what you see. It's about what you feel. It's about what you observe. It's about what happens all around you. And um, we have an organization. I think organizations have cultures. OST has an organizational culture. Teams have subcultures. And and different, you know, groups. And when I say that, um, what I mean is the behavioral aspects about how for us those guiding principles or those core values are lived, they just show up differently. How our sales team lives honor, honoring one another. That's like honoring our employees and their families first. That's one of our guiding principles. How our sales team lives, that looks a little different than how our technical engineering team lives that. They're just different. So we don't say this is what honor looks like because it looks different. Now, what we expect is for everybody inside of OST to behave in a way where every other person who comes into contact with somebody at OST feels honored. That is a behavioral expectation, but we're not gonna say how that behavior necessarily shows up because it could show up in all kinds of ways. So the interesting thing that I, when I think about culture is that it has to be rooted in something higher. It has to be rooted in that purpose. And then you have to give time and space and place for the behavioral elements to show up in ways that may or may not look like the way I would live them. And that can be hard. That can be a challenge, especially when they get challenged, when somebody's like, well, that's not how I would do it. I remember we had our, our one of our teams, our managed services team five or six years ago, um, we do an employee survey and our goal for response of, I would recommend OST is a great place to work. Our goal is 95% affirmative. Like we have a, we set a very high bar for that. And this team, I don't know, probably six or seven years ago, maybe now got like an 87%, which was like, our, my, like what? <laughs> which is still super good. But like, and I said to their manager, to Matt, I was like, you got to get that team in the office because they mostly worked remotely. They mostly, and he's like, no, I don't. I'm like, yes, you do. They need to get here. They're not feeling OST. And he's like, no, I don't. Like, that's not how they work. And he'd like, and I said, okay, you got six months. And he's like, all right. And six months later, sure enough, like scores through the roof because this is a team that like, likes to sit at their keyboard. Like they didn't need. And so I thought, because what I would want is for everybody to come together. That's not how that team operates. So we had the opportunity for that to show up a little differently, but that team needed to feel honored. So when I think about culture, when I think about it, one of the things that I encourage others and when I mentor people who are trying to affect culture in their own companies, when I think about that, it's like, take a look at your team, understand the purpose of the business, and if you believe in the purpose, if you believe in the values, what do you want living those values to look like for the people who are closest to you? And can you affect what it means to live those values or to live that purpose, the behavioral elements? Because at the end of the day, that's really, for me, that's what culture represents. It's a great point. Set the values, set the North Star, but allow people to meander a bit and to maybe get there um, on their own way, maybe not always on their own time, because if something needs to be accomplished in a year, we may not have five to get there. Uh, but yes, that is really a good point. And that's tough for a lot of leaders uh, to relinquish that because they think I, I know best. I've been here. I've been doing this for 37 years. I've gone through all the ranks. I know what the right things are. And, uh, and then it becomes insular. That's why some people say it's lonely at the top, right? That's why it becomes insular because you're trying to project 
not only your own values, which should be shared across the organization, but you're trying to project, you're trying to get people to follow in your footsteps and that but, doesn't work. No, it's super dangerous. Yep. I, so so I, I talk about culture and growth and for, for us, um, I talk to every new employee who comes into OST and I ask three questions are all about culture. And I ask them and say in there, the only way our culture sustains is if each of you commit to living our values. And if we said the only way to do it is the way that we've always done it, how in the world would we do it in a remote work environment? It has to change. You have to give behavior a chance to shift. Like now we send people things to their house. Like we do, you know, Zoom happy hours. Like you have to be able to adapt what that looks like and have it not feel like, oh my gosh, our culture's changed. We just, we don't have our values anymore because that's the certainty. I have to feel like the ground is solid underneath me. The ground is solid, even though the way it manifests itself can shift and change because that's what makes us a fluid organization. That's what makes it sustainable. And, and that's, you know, another part of, one of the things, while we look for consistency and we we'll look for things that are, you know, certain to a degree, innovation and change are the only constants, right? If you're doing the same thing the way we've always done it, you know, one of the, I don't know, I think it was a book that I read somewhere a while ago, and they talk about uh, major transformational things, right? So innovation can be incremental. I've done a lot of research on this from whether it's, or, or accidental, right? Penicillin, post-it notes, and so on, right? Accidents. Um, to things that have been built upon, like wireless transmission um, of, of sounds across the Atlantic was done and kind of intentionally searched for by a number of scientists for a number of years until one finally built, kind of on the, stood on the shoulders of giants and completed that. But um, one of the things that, that, um, that I find really interesting is how do you build that culture of innovation? And what, is, what does innovation mean to you? Um, is it, and how do you get people to not become defensive because they will interpret that as he or she is pulling the rug from underneath me and they're changing the way I, we've always done things and in certain industries, higher education, healthcare, and some others. Yeah. People like the way they've done things for the last 30 or 40 years that they've been here. So how do you build that innovation and build that culture where it's okay to fail? Well, it's okay to try something new and it's absolutely human not to even expect to be perfect at any of it along the way. Yeah, yeah, that's the, that's the you know, million dollar question a lot in our, in our industry. My take on innovation is so much innovation is, it is kind of, moving things forward. You know, it's kind of incremental. Um, great big innovation is hard because, and I, and I look at like Steve Jobs quote, uh, innovation is the ability to see change as an opportunity and not a threat. Like that's hard. Most people do see truly innovative change as, as a threat. And we've all heard, right? Blockbuster, Netflix and whatever, like whatever those big, big changes are, are, are considered threats and, and we're afraid to make them. Um, and, you know, in an organization where you can, in fact, embrace change, you can, in fact, embrace failure. And you talked, I mean, you talked just about it. Uh, first, it comes from celebrating when you screw up. Like, can you actually celebrate when you screwed up? It's tough you know? to do. Right. I just told a story a minute ago where I said something about, you know, Matt, the guy that ran my managed services team that I thought I had the right answer of how he should manage his team. And he told me I was wrong. Like I tell that story also recognizing that I have a guy who worked for me. who was like, you're, you're not right. Like my ability to say that I had a guy and he was right. And I was wrong. Like, I'm glad because he was right. And I was wrong. Thank goodness. He didn't listen to me. Like, how are we also demonstrating as leaders that a, we didn't have the answers and B thank goodness. We didn't have the answers because look what happened instead of that. So we also have to be willing to model that, to celebrate when we learn so we have learned through curiosity and empathy is one of our five guiding principles, as is uh, embrace entrepreneurship and innovation. And 
for us, one of the other things that when I think about entrepreneurship and innovation and innovation in general, to create a culture of innovation means you have to both encourage the folks who do have that gene, who are creative and want to come up with that next cool thing and that next possibility to, to go for it. And for the other people, like the COO in me, who are always like, that won't work. Nope, that's too hard. Like who have that operational mindset. Embrace entrepreneurship and innovation is one of our guiding principles for a reason. Because the other people around those folks have to give their ideas room to breathe. You have to give their ideas a chance. You have to expect that the people around you are going to come up with some crazy stuff. Sometimes they're going to work. Sometimes they're not going to work. That's okay. How can you learn to embrace them no matter what and expect that we're going to try? So part of it is not only encouraging the folks who have the ideas, but also making sure that the rest of the people who are around are, understand that that's what we're trying to create. And that it isn't a bad thing that somebody tried something and it didn't work. And I think you have to create that expectation with both folks because not everybody considers themselves an innovator, right? Most people don't. Um, and I think you have to be okay if you're not. You referenced your five guiding principles. Um, yes. Are they posted on your website? Uh, yes, I believe that they are. Okay, okay. Because I'm interested in, in reading more about them myself sharing them because there's a lot of things there that really resonate with me. Have you in the, let's say, whether it's in your 20 years there plus or seven years as the um, CEO, have any of those values and principles changed? Mm -hmm. And if so, how, in what way? Yeah, great, great question. Um, we, we used to only have four and now we have five. So we actually added a fifth guiding principle. We added learn through curiosity and empathy um, in 2017. And we added that guiding principle after we made an acquisition. So as we've grown up and evolved who we are and what we do and how we do what we do in the technology space, we made an acquisition of a human centered design firm. So we now have this kind of what we call design to data center. We have kind of this, this full capability. And when we looked at that part of our team, that was a capability that we were specifically adding. And it was something that we were already naturally inclined toward, but it was also something that we wanted to get explicit about. So we added that as a fifth guiding principle back in 2017. As you move through your career, as you advanced, and I'm sure you have peaks and valleys the way we all, all have, <laughs> is there a challenge that kept rearing its ugly head more commonly than others? Is there something that you came across and you go, we dealt with this seven, 12, 19 months ago, or I dealt with this 20 years ago at another organization or, or in another environment, and yet it's still prevalent, whether it's your career or the industry as a whole. Are there certain challenges or certain biases that you would like to shine a light on and say, hey, you know, fellow leaders or fellow technology executives or those who are in tech fields, we have to be able to do better at X or Y. Oh, you know, I guess for me, I probably go back to personally, you know, the thing that I go back and struggle with and, and kind of continue to reframe and reframe. And maybe it's just because the older I get and the longer I get in my career. Um, but it, it, in maintaining strong leadership and in maintaining that North Star in the middle of the churn for us and who we are and what we do, staying true to who you are when what you do has to continually evolve, maintaining and figuring out how to um, be consistent with what needs to be consistent, but constantly evolve what has to constantly evolve. And I think trying, it's like, you know, I don't know, rubbing your, patting your head and rubbing your stomach yeah. or what it's like trying to do both of those things. So I think uh, there's like this nimbleness that you have to be able to maintain and to find that, that ability to keep being nimble, but also not losing yourself in the middle of it. Um, 
whether that's an authenticity, personal authenticity and values orientation, obviously organizational authenticity and values orientation, but to really kind of keep coming back to that while you evolve. So me going from, I was talking about my former COO-ness and now I'm the CEO. Like I've had to change how I think about things and how, you know, like even in my own pursuit and my own journey, uh, you know, had to shed some of that. Um, you know, in addition to obviously the organizational shift and change that we've undergone as our whole industry has changed. Make a great point of um, being aware of the differences in roles and positions and responsibilities. A lot of the folks that I've seen or some of the folks that I've worked with have been in a particular organization in a particular role and they were now promoted or moved to a different position, different side of the house. And all they're doing is you know, they're changing their email signature. They're still operating the same way they've operated here, even though they require completely different mindset, different focus. I have these conversations with all the CFOs I've always worked with over my career. I go, look, I understand. We have to be buddies. We have to figure things out, right? You guys have the purse strings. I'm going to spend most of it on tech and innovation (laughs) and research. I get it. But my job is to go out there and break stuff. My job is to try new things. My job is to innovate. My job is for us not to be too comfortable sitting on the hill and then get ran over by the competitors in five, seven, 10 years. And we go, how did that happen? Well, I could have told you. Your job is to not rock the boat. Your job is to be predictable. Your job is to manage expenses. I get it. They're polar opposites. That's why I sometimes struggle when I see, and I've been in that role at one point in my career as well, Fortunately enough, I had a great relationship with, with, my, with the CFO who I reported to at that point. But that's why I struggle when I have CIOs and CFOs. When CIO reports to the CFO, I mean, they're different beasts. In today's world, they need to be peers. Indeed. Um, and um, as you're moving, in, you know, you, you, you said this when you and I spoke last, I can say this, last year, just you know, a couple of weeks ago, um, in our prep for the call, you said that, and I, I, was going, I looked at my notes to my right, and I underlined it. It stood out to me then, and it stood out to me now. Is that focus on who we are over what we do? Yes. There are people whose job is to focus on what we do. But, you know, focusing on that soul, that heart of the company, of the organization, of your community, the fact that you see that as one of your most important um, values and responsibilities, which I'm sure you impart on the rest of your leadership team, is is very admirable. It's it's exciting for me to hear because way too many folks, um, a lot of the Fortune 1000s that I used to work with, you know, they live and die by quarterly earnings calls, and it's all about the numbers. It's always about the numbers, and then yeah. at some point they get their golden parachute, they retire, company goes out of business three years later, and people go, how did that happen? Yeah, nothing flies in the face of an innovative uh, uh, desire and approach faster than quarterly earnings. Yep. Like I think about Simon Sinek's, you know, the infinite game. Like you have to have an infinite mindset. You play a finite game in business, like it's over. It's over. Yeah, it's over. If it's a the pot, the pie is fixed, and once the big players came in and took their slices, there's nothing left. So therefore, no, go bake another pie. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Make another one. Says who? Yeah, let's right. go. Who says yeah. that it's just one? Make it all. Yeah. yeah. Um, and I agree with you. So um, as we're approaching the hour, what advice do you have for those who aspire to, you know, one day earn their place to a position like the one you occupy today? What stood out to you over your career? What are the things to spend more time being mindful about? And what are maybe some things not to take too seriously along the way? Oh, so first of all, yeah, have some fun. I probably didn't do enough of that along the way. I'll be honest. Um, I think the 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 main thing that I would tell people um, is that if you want to lead and you aspire to continue to have an opportunity to lead and lead more and lead bigger and lead more, um, don't ever make it about you. Don't ever make it about you. And the ability to truly, truly serve 
one another, to serve someone else. I wake up every day. Am I using my God-given talents to the best of my ability? I wake up every day and challenge myself to that. Am I doing that? Am I doing that well? And my take is if that's what you commit to doing, are you doing what you're really great at? And if you feel like you're called to lead, are you serving? Are you serving others? Because if you serve in that intent and you're capable, because you also have to be capable, but if you're both, if that's your desire and you're capable and you don't make it about you, people will follow. Leaders are born because people follow them. Like that's how it works. And so for me, I would say, keep serving and give yourself platforms that allow folks to have the opportunity to follow you, but make it about the, what you see and how you can serve from a leadership perspective, hands down hundred percent and never stop learning. Like the minute you think you have the answers, you're wrong, by the way. Uh, there's vulnerability and humility in that. That's the other hard part, though. Um, and I'll say as a woman in technology, I think that's also a fine line maybe that I walked as I thought, especially when I first got me was promoted to president and CEO that I had to kind of had this thing, new thing to prove. And um, what what I came to learn, it took me a while, maybe, you know, nine or nine months, maybe uh, in the role that I was like, I'm going to be successful leading the way I've been leading. Either it will be enough or it won't be enough, but it will only be enough if I do it a way that's authentic to who I am. And I think in that, in that time and in that season as well, it was reinforced that you have to do it in a way that's authentic to who you are. Um, and it, it served me. Okay. I would, I would say so. That's a, that's a very powerful message um, at the end where, you know, I don't even know who said this or who was it attributed to, but, you know, one of the sayings that I have repeated probably countless times in my life is be yourself. Everyone else is already taken, right? And it's just not authentic when you're trying to be something or someone you're not, and it's visible from a mile away. And at the end of the day, the comment you just made, if you are honest with yourself and therefore honest with everybody else, if you succeed, you succeeded because of who you are. If you don't, you were still true to yourself. You were who you are. It just wasn't the right time, wasn't the right fit. You're going to take your skills and capabilities somewhere else. But if you succeed being something you're not or someone you're not, one, it's not authentic. It's not sustainable. Now you have to morph into this role and this person who you're not. And two, if you don't succeed, you didn't succeed and you didn't even try to be yourself. You failed because you were copying somebody else. So I think that's a very powerful message uh, to share. And another one is what you talked about, you know, waking up every, every morning and, and thinking about your talents. Are you serving the right way? One of the things that I like to share with people is find a nexus or an apex where three things come together, right? One is what you love to do. Two, what you're good at. Because I know a lot of people who were really good at something but hated doing it or loved doing it, but they really weren't good at it, right? And then the third thing is what the community society needs. And you can't lose. If there's a need for it, right? One of the examples that one of my friends from Jersey uses all the time is underwater basket weaving. They go, Mike, you can love underwater basket weaving and you can be really good at it. But if nobody wants to buy your baskets, <laughs> that's a problem. Yep. It could be a hobby. He goes, yeah, you're right. So finding a place where those three come together, I think it's a really powerful message. Um, I know we're almost at time. I feel like I could talk to you for days and, and I'm, I would love to Likewise. have part two at some point down the road. But at the end of every episode, I ask the guest to ask a question of the audience. Mm. Um, is there anything that, you know, for those who are watching or listening, is there anything that you want to ask them any, you know, market research data, I've seen people use, ask all kinds of things. What, what is, what is a, a question or, or, or something, a point of interest for you at this point in time? Man. Oh, okay. I'm going to cheat. I have two. I have two when I think Please about do. it. Um, one is around the acceleration of adoption. Uh, I talked about user experience and data. I'm curious uh, what I'm missing. 
Like what else is there when, when, when your listeners and folks who are watching this think about what their, why they adopt, why they use technology, how they, what they think from a usefulness perspective, what are the other elements that uh, maybe we should be thinking about, or I should be thinking about, uh, we'll be curious about that. So that's maybe more kind of on the, on the innovation and, and adoption perspective. And the other one is more uh, on the boundaries in the future of work really as a leader of an organization and as a leader of people that wants to provide the best possible place for people to do what they love to do, which is kind of my calling. Um, and I'm thinking about boundaries and you and I explored that for a little bit. Um, what, would that, what would that environment look like for you? What would that perfect work environment, assuming you have an opportunity to do that from home, what would that environment look like for you? What would those boundaries need to look like? Um, what am I missing? I'm going to ask the same question of my team tomorrow, but what else? Yeah, those are wonderful questions. And I wonder if, you know, down the road, uh, once you learn something from your team, you start implementing those things. And I'm going to take some of the advice and some of the suggestions that you have shared in the past hour. And I'm going to use it myself. I will obviously attribute them to you. <laughs> but I'm, I'm interested in, in always finding a ways. It's walking that fine balance between performance and getting things done. Um, in understanding that not everybody moves at the same pace and not everybody comes with the same set of skills out of the gate. So then how do you find that environment and create it where people are leveraged in the right way and they have the opportunities to continue to grow and advance and, and contribute beyond repetitive mundane tasks? Even those I've been told in the past that, you know, I do what I do nine to five. I love doing it. I don't want to go into management or leadership because, you know, comes with a different set of ex expectations and responsibilities that I don't have today, so therefore I don't want them. If you found yourself already where you are, you won. My hat goes off to you and you won. But most people are looking to be something, uh, members of something bigger and larger than themselves. Mm -hmm. So um, this has been wonderful. This has been exceptional. Um, I am honored um, to have met you. I'm very thankful to um, our colleague who brought us together. We now live in the same town and, and I look forward to hopefully becoming a friend of yours down the road and learning more from you and hopefully being someone who can be of value to you and your team as well. Absolutely. Uh, thank you very much for joining me today. So sorry, go ahead. Oh, I just said it's really, it's been a pleasure. I've enjoyed the conversation today. I'm really, really grateful. Thank you. Um, thank you for joining me today. And thank you to all of you who are watching and are listening to this. Um, until next time, I wish everyone a wonderful day, week, month. And don't ever forget, when you want something, you should go after it. But you need to understand that that comes with some work, effort, and energy. Because at the end of the day, there really are no shortcuts to greatness. Have a wonderful day. Take care.